Uh, agora... Next, on behalf of W3C, I would like to run a very short video. It's a video from the global CEO from our consortium. He's got some. He's got a message to share with you. participation in the 8th annual web at Brazil W3CBR conference uh, that's taking place this week. You know, web technologies have had an enormous impact on the world, uh, to people as consumers, and increasingly to industry after industry. And I'm so pleased that this week you will be hearing from two of the unbelievable web architects that work from W3C as part of your program. Specifically, I'm pleased to introduce Bert Boss. Bert is one of the founders, one of the original team that wrote the CSS <laughs> and continues his work in many related topics, styling, CSS specifically, the Houdini project, digital publications as examples. And also Dave Raggett. Dave Raggett, of course, was part of the original HTML team. And most notably, he is bringing the Internet of Things to the web through his Web of Things project. You will learn so much this week from these two individuals about what we're doing and also how you can help contribute to the future of web technology. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Okay, muito obrigado, Jeff, pela... Thank you, Jeff, for your kind words. I don't know if Jeff is following us. As we are broadcasting this session live with translation to English and Portuguese, so it may be that they are following us. So once again, thank you so much for your participation and all the support that you gave us to put this conference together. David Raggett, Jeff has already introduced uh, Mr. Raggett. I just like to add to that introduction that uh, David Raggett, in addition to be currently working with Web of Things, he has participated since the very beginning of HTML. So it's been quite a while that he's dealing with W3C open standards. Dave, he is a PhD by the University of Oxford. And today, as a W3C member, staff, staff member, he coordinates the Web of Things uh, initiatives. You have the floor, Dave. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. A big round of applause to him. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your availability. And thank you very much, Davy. So, how do we get the slide up? Uh -huh. So, uh, good morning. So, I hope I don't get too dizzy walking around here. This is the first time I've been on a round stage where you have to look behind you to the side and in the front. But I'll try to move around. So, uh, yeah, it's been, the web has been a very interesting project. I'm an engineer, so I've been around for quite a few years now. And the web was very exciting when we got involved. There's just a handful of web servers. And then over the next few years, we saw this grow exponentially from just a tiny number to a huge number everywhere. So we're hoping to do the same for the Internet of Things. And I hope in my talk I'll explain how we're trying to approach this. Ah, good. So there's been a lot of hype about the, the Internet of Things. Um, the Internet of Things essentially is about uh, access to connected uh, devices, the sensors and actuators. There are many potential application areas, and I'm sure that most of these areas are just the start, and like with the web, that we have no idea what people will come up with, what crazy new ideas and what new business models which will be uh, um, thought of over the time. And like with the internet, we've seen the rise of companies and the fall of other companies. We've seen you know, the internet giants you know, become uh, and the huge biggest companies in the world. So we can expect similar kind of disruptions from the internet of things. 
the Internet of Things is very confusing. There's uh, lots of different areas, or sort of application areas, lots of standards, lots of products. But right now, they're all kind of in isolation. It's not really an Internet of Things. It's more like a silo, lots of silos of things. And so, you know, this is very confusing for developers. And so that's one of the reasons at W3C we're trying to find ways to simplify things for developers uh, and for investors too. So um, there's a rapidly evolving suite of technologies for the Internet of Things. So I list some here. So I've divided these into two broad groups, um, Internet protocols and the kind of a, the Internet of Things communication technologies themselves. Uh, and I won't go through the whole details here. But obviously, HTTP is uh, one of those. That's an internet protocol. And it's something which in, I was involved in the, in the early days, helping to launch the standardization of that in the ITF back in the, the, the early 90s. Um, W3C has been working with the ITF like for, for uh, sort of related protocols, like WebSockets. And there are lots of other protocols which are designed around different purposes, like pub sub protocols. Um, where you know, something publishes on some topic and then other clients can subscribe to that topic to get notifications. And more recently, W3C has also been working on WebRTC. And WebRTC is not just for video and audio, but it's also to allow devices to communicate uh, data from peer to peer. And that will be important for the Web of Things too. So there are many different sort of IoT to communication technologies. Um, I, let me just go for a few of these. Low power wide area networks is where the, 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 the telecommunication operators are hoping to support, make it easy through narrowband to access from like smart meters out into the cloud. Wi-Fi we all use and we're using here. Uh, Bluetooth has been very popular. Then some others like NOcean is a, a sort of protocol for building automation and it relies on ambient power, devices which gather the power of the environment. So it's not relying on batteries, but relying on scavenging energy, whether it's heat differences or, or um, uh, electromagnetic radiation or other sources of energy. So this is an idea that devices could be very low power and could be running off at the ambient, you know, so they disappear into the environment in some ways. And then I'll say a little bit more about body area network shortly. Um, I've added barcodes at the bottom here in, in italics because it's not really a communications technology, but it's a way of hooking things up, and it's kind of like identifier, which allows you then to link to whatever the, the barcode means. And so, for example, when you go to the supermarket and you check out, you know, barcodes are ubiquitous uh, for tying that product into the, system, into the pricing, into the stock holding, and everything else. So, given the very broad range of application domains, uh, there's no one protocol and no one communication pattern that's going to address all the needs. So it's very important to try to think about you know, the needs more generally. So we need to uh, think about what kinds of communication patterns we need to address. We need to make sure the standards don't preclude some of these patterns. It's all too easy for people who come from a particular background to see the world from that background, just like in politics, where people come from a particular background, maybe the left or the right, and they see the world through that, and they ignore problems that they don't care about or don't think about. Whole sections of community disappear from their mindset. So the same is true for engineers, I'm afraid. So we need to make sure that we talk to each other, and we really try to listen to each other's needs to make sure the standards really address all the, the, the requirements and can be as successful as we hope. So some of these, for example, on the factory floor, it's kind of real-time requirements, uh, you know, when you want to respond to things very, very quickly. Um, then there's data streaming, streaming information from sensors to the cloud. That's clearly very important. Um, in some cases, it doesn't matter if you lead the, lose the odd sample of sensor reading. Uh, like maybe you're just measuring uh, people's heart rate. And if you just lose one me me uh, reading now, it doesn't matter because you'll get the next ones pretty soon. In other cases, you want to do logging. And it could be that for liability reasons or kind of data loggers, you, have to, you really, really have to have all these samples. You can't afford to miss something like in a black box in an airplane. So, you know, the different communication patterns have very different requirements. Uh, another case is that you want to send data updates and periodically, you're just sending an update. And that contrasts with streaming where you're sending a large amount of data regularly. Um, another, so sometimes you need to uh, send, uh, buffer the data that could be because devices, you know, to make their batteries last longer, or it could be to improve the efficiency of the network. 
And then another thing, as I mentioned about these ambient power devices or batteries, devices designed to run off a battery for its entire lifetime of several years. For these, they have to spend most of their time asleep. And um, so these devices, you know, you can't just talk to them. They're not online. You have to wait till they wake up. Um, so there's sort of all different kinds of possibilities around the communication requirements. And you've got to make sure that the architectures and the standards we come up with support these. And at the bottom here, there's some of the patterns, uh, like push, you're pushing data out uh, into the cloud or pushing it out to a client, or pull where you're pulling it. Like with HTTP, you do an HTTP request to a server to get some information, and then it sends it back to you. So that's a kind of a pull. PubSub, you know, I mentioned that before. Um, and then peer-to-peer, -peer, like with WebRTC. So lots of different patterns we have to be able to support. Um, I thought this might be interesting, the body area networks. So the idea of the generation of healthcare, uh, um, particularly as the population's age, like in uh, countries, in, in, in some European countries and, and uh, countries like Japan, where there's an aging population, and you want to be able to improve the quality of healthcare with it while keeping a lid on the costs. So the idea of having devices you're wearing on your body or even in, inside your body, uh, and uh, new kind of technologies to support that. And um, so I refer here to some work by Etsy on a kind of a very short range uh, um, networking technology to support that. Um, streaming to the cloud. So here we have a devices and then we have some typically some kind of gateway which is uh, translating protocols but also providing looking after improved security because very small devices are often limited in their capabilities to support security. So you rather than make making them accessible directly on the internet itself, you want to access them through a gateway which provides that protection. And here I've provided uh, an illustration from just one of the many vendors of IoT cloud platforms, in this case Google. And you can see, therefore, we have devices which may be connected not by HTTP or not by IP, but maybe by non-IP protocols even. Then we have a variety of gateways. And then we have in the cloud different purposes. So you're looking after things like uh, big data, uh, analytics, uh, machine learning, and, uh, and personalized services around the individual users. So we need open standards to support this, because otherwise our data is going to be siloed, and we're going to be tied into particular cloud and particular vendors. So uh, the whole thing about the IoT, in many ways, is that uh, it's combining information from different sources, combining information from different suppliers. And that means not everybody's going to be using the same platform. So we have to have open standards to connect to these different platforms. Um, in the home or in offices or even in factories, uh, there's the idea of pushing um, some of the processing out to the network edge or into hubs. And so here I'm showing an example from Sm Samsung SmartThings. And you can see the boxes there on the right. So this is idea that you have a box which acts like, like a server in your home, and it connects via these different technologies to the particular devices in your home. And then you can install services onto this hub. And uh, currently, again, this is all siloed. It's using proprietary technologies. But there's an opportunity to introduce uh, open web standards, an open web platform for hubs for the smart home. And uh, one of the reasons motivating this is that for some people uh, concerned about their privacy, they don't necessarily want to have all the information that all these extra sensors and things can do um, going out into the cloud. They would rather it goes to a, only stored in their home and their home hub. And, and then you can have applications which between the hubs in a peer-to-peer -peer model, kind of like a social network or social web of things. Okay. So manufacturing is a, a, another big area here. I'm not going to go through all the domains. There are too many domains. But I thought I'd mention a few things about manufacturing. So I've been sort of um, involved to a little extent to the work going on in Germany on what they call Industry 4.0. And so in, in Germany, they're obviously a big manufacturing cunt, uh, company, country. And um, they want to maintain their kind of lead in that area. And so moving away from mass production to bespoke production, small runs or perhaps in run sizes of one, so the products are highly personalized. So now you don't have production lines, but it's more like a kind of a, a web of production cells and things flowing between these cells, telling each production, each robot, what the robot needs to do at that stage in the process. So this will allow uh, um, companies to react much quicker to changing market conditions. So rather than having like fashions where everybody has to wear the same thing or buy the same car, 
Everything is going to be personalized, so it's going to be an interesting challenge to marketing people to persuade us all to be, in some ways, different, not all the same. And um, so this requires uh, integration. So integration um, vertically from the production cells in the factory all the way up to the boardroom. And again, going across many different platforms using many different standards. And another thing, like, I'm particularly thinking of Michael Porter and the work that he did with others in the Harvard Business Review um, on uh, the idea of um, value chains within enterprises. And so what part of the value of the IoT will being able to link across the value chain with, within an enterprise and across the supply chain and out into the consumers, the customers, uh, for the entire lifetime that the products are out there. So um, it's integration, and so we need to open standards to support this integration. Um, cyber physical systems. So I was trying to figure out what exactly the meaning of cyber is, and it doesn't seem to have a clear meaning. It sort of derives from sort of a Greek word for governance or control, but it's now just used to mean something connected to something computers. But cyber physical systems are essentially a network of interacting uh, components with physical uh, interact control, you know, so it's sensing and in, uh, controlling things. And the American, uh, US NS, the US National Science Foundation, they talk about seamless integration of uh, computational algorithms and physical components. And there's a big research push funding into cyber physical systems. And um, so the idea is to express control perhaps at different levels, just like within the human body where we have control at different kind of levels, um, you know, otherwise we won't be able to, to, to function at all. So uh, you know, what would you use this for? Well, there's examples here of uh, uh, wireless sensor networks where, the, like I mentioned about the kind of pushing some of the processing out to the edge, rather than doing all the processing in the cloud, which would kind of overwhelm the cloud, uh, you need to do processing at the edge. So you can put the, distribute that processing out to the edge into part of the sensor network. And um, then we have, obviously, cars, a lot of interest in vehicles uh, in, in the moment. And W3C is also active in this area. So with the modern engines, uh, when I first bought a car many years ago, they were really, really crude and really simple. I could figure out how to fix it. Not anymore, because they involve so many computers and so many sort of computerized sensors and controls uh, that they are cyber physical systems in their own right today. And that's only going to get uh, exaggerated even further as we move towards self-driving cars with all the systems that they involve there. Then um, smart grids and smart energy. So here, uh, obviously, everybody starts to become perhaps a generator or a consumer of electricity and power with um, solar panels on the roof or maybe wind turbines, but also storage devices so that you can tell So when there's a, um, a massive demand on power, peak, peak demand, then uh, the network could tell the devices, you know, please reduce the power or defer something. And likewise, it could say, well, actually, I need to borrow power from your house and maybe from your um, smart car, you know, from your electrical car, or maybe from some other storage device. Anyway, so smart uh, power and smart grids are another big area. And, uh, and medical, I've talked a bit about medical already, um, and then the process control and manufacturing, of course. So lots of concepts involved in this, uh, in the, the table on the right. I'm sure these slides will be made available because I'm not going to go for that list here. But you can see there are many different aspects at different levels of abstraction to be dealt with and why this is still an important research area. So I'm next going to talk a bit about overcoming fragmentation. Um, the Internet of Things is still very, very immature. Let me just check on the time. Um, the Internet of Things has uh, been around, been talked about for some years, but the truth is it's really at a very, very early stage. And so companies and, and people still are playing around, exploring things and making mistakes, and that's fine. So the internet, we can look at the internet itself, perhaps for some lessons from inspiration. So if you look at the internet, uh, before the internet, there were many different networking technologies. Uh, for example, Novell Netware, IBM Token Ring, X25, and many others. And at that point, the market for network services was very limited because you were limited to that particular technology. With the introduction of the internet, the internet protocol, we have the IP, the IP address, internet protocol address, we have packets, internet packets, all layered up on top of the underlying technologies that made it simple to communicate across the different technologies end to end, but also it's made it much simpler for developers to create applications without having to be experts on the individual technologies. And that then allows services to take off and the introduction of the web uh, that again 
further exponential growth over many years. And um, so we are in a similar situation with the IoT. We have this fragmentation, these silos. It's like, it's like before the internet. We need an abstraction layer corresponding to the role of the internet for the internet of things. So um, here is a kind of an attempt to do this in terms of the web of things, an abstraction layer above the internet of things. And we start with the notion of things. So you have physical devices, you also have physical things like a sensor, in this case a temperature sensor, but also abstract things, maybe, I don't know, is this room a physical thing or is it a concept? This meeting, surely it's not a physical thing. This particular conference is an abstract idea. And yet you might want to talk about it, talk about its relationship to other events, talk about like tickets, sales, and so on. So we want to be able to have things which represent physical and abstract entities and to be able to expose those two applications to, uh, um, to create services around them. And so for that, we uh, can use software objects and build upon over three decades of experience of object-oriented programming and event-driven uh, behavior. And we can also, but for this, we need some way of describing these things. So we need rich descriptions. And so everything has to have a name. So a, a, a universal resource identifier is a name. And you can use this name then to access the thing's description. And uh, then we can have arrange these vocabularies or ontologies around these the things and their relationships. And the proposal is to use build on W3C's work on the semantic web and linked data. And um, things can represent uh, local, you can access these things as well locally or remotely. It doesn't really matter. I could have some application running on my phone which is controlling something running the other side of the world. Or I could have an application running on a device which is controlling services actually on that device itself. It doesn't really matter where things are located. And uh, finally, there's this idea of things um, having properties, action, and events, which is building upon the metaphors which have been so successful with object-oriented programming. So uh, in this diagram, I'm not sure how visible it is on the screens, so my colleague uh, Coralie Messier put these together. You see in the boxes on the left, there's all these different kind of power connectors and sockets. So each country, as we know, there's slight subtle differences in the, in the electrical power outlets. Like the, the, in, in here in Brazil, the, the, the plugs look very similar to the ones in Switzerland, but they don't match exactly. So they don't plug together. And so we have this issue that we have these silos and you can't plug things together. So what do you do? We need some way of being able to plug them into a, a common abstraction layer. And if we do that right, we can reduce the costs and the complexities and the risks uh, for developing services, and we allow the market for services to expand dramatically, which will make the investors happy. So we want to uh, enable exponential growth based on open markets of services. And uh, so we, to do this, there's, there's two levels. Going back to the internet analogy, um, we want to make it easier for application developers by avoiding them having to know about the details of the protocols and the communication patterns. But we also want to uh, uh, enable interoperability across these different platforms. How does platform, one platform, uh, know how to talk to a completely different platform? And the answer is you've got to tell it. To so tell it, you have to some way of describing platforms and services. So we need to work on uh, metadata. We need some common ways or interlingua for, for metadata, for descriptions, and building on top of the work that W3C has done. And a final aspect of this is the semantics we want to be able to have semantic models uh, uh, of things and their relationships and their domain constraints. I'll explain a bit more about that in a sec. Um, maybe this is a little bit too much detail, but the main thing in this diagram here to show is that you could have one sort of application which is... Exp uh, you can have an application which is acting as a kind of server, which is publishing a service or publishing a thing. And so that's here on the right, server B. And that's, that script is communicate directly, say, with a particular sensor or actuator, and that's exposing this as a thing for other applications to running somewhere else to use. And then on another server, server A on the left, we can uh, use the URI or the, the uh, universal resource identifier for the thing description to pull down that information and then allow that server to expose uh, uh, the object for the application running on server uh, A to communicate with, to interact with. And this can be done in many different kind of topologies. It's not just, it's very simple to think of it just in terms of one, your favorite approach. But the idea is it produces great flexibility on how you can put these things together. 
Um, so coming back to semantics and linked data, uh, we want to have semantic descriptions. And why? Because they enable platforms to communicate to make sure they're talking about the same thing. They mean the same thing. They share the meaning uh, of, the, of the data they're exchanging. And this can be used then to support discovery. You can discover things based on the properties and relationships of things. And we want to be able to now search engines like we have today with Bing and, and Google and Yandex and others. Uh, we want to allow search engines to be able to index the web of things. So for that, we have to have agreement on how to, uh, to expose this, uh, uh, these rich descriptions. Um, semantics are also can be used for verifying that a thing you know, it conforms or matches a particular semantic model. And uh, it can be used to then support comp compositions where you want to combine services from different suppliers together to create some new third party service. And you want to make sure that if you put these, you know, this recipe of putting things together, it'll work as stated. So for that, you need these rich models. And so W3C has a rich suite of uh, technologies around this. I think this diagram is a little out of date now. It's, we've gone a bit further than that. So there's active work on semantic technologies, which W3C hopes to uh, contribute to this area. Um, I won't really go through all the details in this diagram. The main point about here is that the, you can think about layers. As engineers, we solve problems by dividing them up into different problems and handing them across to people who have the expertise appropriate. You know, so you have different kinds of concerns, whose expertise in that particular area, and who, and whose business is that particular area. So in, the main thing here is to distinguish between the application developer and a platform developer. So the application developer uh, needs to know about you know, the, the things it wants to interact with, you know, what its properties, action events, and the kind of metadata, but they don't want to know about the details of how the platforms communicate. So it's other metadata, which is targeting the platform developer, which is looking at the, uh, uh, you know, how do I access this, what protocols do I use, what communication patterns do I use, what are the security requirements for talking from this platform to another platform. And so you know, we have this series of layers, each with their different aspects. And so for some people, like coming from a particular protocol background, like using HTTP um, or, or uh, protocols like that, they're very, they're very keen on using REST or RESTful uh, um, uh, uh, patterns for this, and RESTful APIs. But that can't be the whole story. We have to bear in mind this broad variety of requirements. And then at the bottom, as I mentioned, that uh, not all, uh, uh, you can't necessarily rely on there even being IP, or let alone IPv6, on every device. Although obviously that is the trend, to move the IP out as far as we can. But some devices, and, uh, uh, we have to be able to live with existing devices which don't support IP or may never support IP. So I was going to say a few words about the, the W3C activity where we are and that status and obviously try to encourage you or the companies you and organizations you represent to get involved and help us make this a success. Because as I said, this is still at a very, very early stage. Um, okay, so I, I, just a few words about the organization I work for. So W3C, the mission is to lead the web to its full potential. I think this is the kind of thing we, we dreamed of, brainstormed up one day in MIT all those years ago. And uh, as you heard earlier, the web can be, is can considered as being the largest vendor neutral uh, networked uh, uh, distributed application platform. And um, so Tim Berners-Lee, uh, there's a lot of work on hypertext um, in the 80s and, and even earlier. But uh, at the time, um, the, by the end of the 80s, there was no kind of coherent approach to, to hypertext across the net. Uh, there were some early things going out, like something called Gopher, which was a, a means of, sort of menuing system you could access, you could follow menu links, but it didn't really have hypertext links in documents. And so Tim had this sort of idea that if we could have a way of describing the, the links, then we could embed these links within documents, and then you could have uh, browsers which could render these things, and users could follow the links within the documents themselves. And uh, I met Tim Berners-Lee in 1992, uh, after a project I've been working on at HP. And um, we got on well, and so we got involved with that. So uh, the web, thinking much more about the web as a web of services, a, a web of applications. And it took a few years, but we, we got there. And so W3C is member funded, and um, we have now some over 400 members, and we've developed a wide variety of technologies, so I won't go through the list here. But increasingly, we're spreading out across new domains like um, uh, mobile, I mean, some years TV, 
uh, you know, the HTML and the TV. Automotive is a big area where you know, we've been working on for the last few years. And digital publishing is a relatively recent area, and the web of things likewise. So um, we started off um, by bringing together a workshop to try and see, you know, is, do people generally share the general idea around you know, what are the requirements for healing this problem, countering this fragmentation of the IoT. So we had a workshop in um, Berlin in 2014, and then we launched a, an interest group to try and bring people together to share ideas about use case and requirements, to review the kind of technologies, to identify gaps, and to start doing practical stuff. So we have this interest group, and each face-to-face -face meeting for the interest group, we have plug fests where people, developers, and it works on, on trying things out, relatively small scale, but um, nonetheless internationally and across companies. And the interest group has come up with ideas for uh, standardization, and so now we're proposing to launch a working group to, to standardize these ideas. And that working group charter is cu currently being reviewed by the WC members. Tomorrow is the last day of that review. But so far, we've had a lot of positive support, so that looks like it'll go ahead. And so we'll have a working group focusing on uh, areas like uh, cross-platform, um, cross-domain, rather, uh, vocabularies of metadata, and all sort of APIs and a few other aspects. And but that's engineers, and engineers like to focus like the laser precision on a particular problem. But we also need people to thinking from, from a business perspective. You know, what are the business drivers, and what requirements do that impose on the technical work? So we're planning on launching a business group for people from a business perspective to look at the kind of requirements across application domains, but also to help them reaching out across organizations to help build a kind of a shared understanding convergence. And this is a picture in the photograph from a, a kind of recent face-to-face -face meeting we had in uh, uh, Beijing. Um, just a quick look at some of the companies and organizations in the interest group. Um, that is, in fact, out of date, and there's more than that. But anyway, a large number of companies, but we're seeking new organizations to join the W3C work. So if your organization, you think it's going to be impacted by the IoT, and it pro most like probably all organizations, and you're in a position to actually help and you want to drive the future, because remember, it's still pretty immature, so everybody's contribution can make a big difference, then please try to uh, get involved. Um, so I talked about this need for coordination across different organizations. Um, so this slide comes from the Alliance Internet of Things Innovation, which is a group set up by the European Commission. Uh, it's a public-private partnership. And it was set up to support the research. They're putting in a, a large amounts of money, something, I don't know, uh, well over 100 million euros into some large-scale uh, IoT pilots starting at the, the beginning of the year, uh, next year. And you can see that they put together these kind of landscape studies of architecture, and in this case, uh, standards organizations and alliances. And you can see there's vertical, uh, vertical columns and horizontal column of, um, row. And the idea here is that different organizations are kind of grouped roughly in either into addressing particular application domains or more generally across. So W3C is at the bottom here, as you can see in the sort of bottom sort of middle left, I guess. And so the there's a huge challenge if you're a company, which standards groups do you get involved in and why? And what are the relationship between these different standards organizations? So trying to build a common understanding of that is an important step. So we need to reach out to across these alliances and standards development organizations to drive convergence because presumably we all have this shared idea that we want to create these large market opportunities to realize the potential. Um, so you know, we've been work reaching out to, uh, in to Germany in the platform industry 4.0 and particularly the, the group working on the semantics of that area. Um, there's a new group being set up, they're working on smart homes which I haven't really hoped to be in touch with soon. The uh, Industrial uh, Internet Consortium, we have a sort of a, a, a liaison agreement with them. And uh, then there's the Open Connectivity Foundation, which is a, a sort of a, a gradually coalescing group of um, uh, companies. Um, sort of, it was Intel and Samsung, and, and now others, Microsoft and Qualcomm more recently. Um, we have in digital automation, the OPC Foundation. They're focusing particularly on smart manufacturing, but they want to move more broadly and they have their own approach to modeling uh, uh, semantics. 
and we want to sort of converge that with the uh, already allowed in ink to lingua between that and other representations. Anyway, I won't go through the whole list of these because uh, the details of this will take too long. But the, the, the whole point is we need to talk across organizations to realize the potential. Uh, another point which is kind of very relevant to developers and to small to medium-sized companies and startups is the standardization process is kind of uh, takes years, right? It can take several years before you can uh, put, get a standard together. And that's all very well if you're a very large company and you can afford to invest the resources and the time. But what about a small startup and you have the investors breathing down your neck and you have to get to market like really quick now? Uh, how do we help the small companies, the small uh, developers to make progress? And so here, um, thinking about the idea of being able to do community building, can you see what other people have done? You know, how, why did they put a vocabulary together? Can we look at what they did? Can we talk to those people to find out what they did? Can we upload our proposals and see what feedback we get? Can we measure how successful the particular vocabularies uh, are, are? Who's using them for what? So we can gradually increase in maturity from a totally experimental to something which is relied upon by companies and organizations around the world. So we need new agile processes for standardization around uh, metadata vocabularies. And so this is something where uh, there's discussion about that. And I helped to launch a joint white paper across a, a, whole, a large number of organizations some months back. And so that's now done. And that was just the first, very, very first step, which is to say, um, you know, what is semantic interoperability? And why does it matter? And then we can start talking about kind of next steps. And um, we, we need these agile processes, though, and that's a key thing. The traditional standards organizations, uh, you know, aren't quite a good match for the startups. Um, another huge area where we need coordination across different groups, different standards, is uh, security. So if you follow the media, you'll see there's lots of security scares around the IoT. And companies or managers don't really take seriously how hard it is to do security right. So there's lots of uh, need uh, for, for better understanding, for joint work on best practices and uh, technical standards. And again, the plan is to do a joint white paper as an initial step with individual contributions from people from a broad range of backgrounds to try to bring together the work that's being done in different groups and try and figure out you know, what needs to be done next in that area to allow end-to-end -end secu uh, uh, security across different platforms. Um, and you know, because today it's, it's extremely hard, basically more or less fail. Um, then there's the, the role of big data. So with lots of sensors, there's vast, huge, huge amounts of uh, data. So actually, I'm not even sure what a zettabyte is, but it's a very big number, I'm told. So the idea is that uh, pretty soon there'll be very large amounts of data. And the analysts are suggesting that most of this data has to be pre-processed at the network edge before being passed up. So this is the idea of fog computing, where you distribute the processing from the cloud down right out to the very edge, like a cloud coming down towards the ground. And this increases lots of risks, um, lots of attack possibilities for criminals. And um, so again, this is where we really need to make sure that we have strong uh, models of security across different platforms. And um, then this is work on the data consolidation as is going on. So companies like Cisco, uh, 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 Hewlett Packard Enterprise and others. Um, a little few words on security, trust, and um, uh, safety and resilience. And then I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly and then hopefully have a discussion, for, um, an interactive discussion, if I can figure out if I've got the right channel for the translation. So strong security relies on, on understanding and adherence to best practices. So it requires a community building around best practices. And that's got to not just be in one particular organization, but it's going to be across organizations. Uh, we need, um, there's trust which can be based on prior agreements between two parties, like one party you know, building a contract with another. But also, that doesn't scale very well, so we have the need for work on attestation by trusted third parties. Like on the internet, uh, you don't really know where the other party is. You know, unless you've met them face to face and built up a trust over some time, how do you know who they are and you know, whether they're trustworthy people to do business with? Um, so there's lots of issues around bootstrapping of trust. Like when you when you have an IoT device, you want to deploy it. Um, how do you build up the trust around that device? So this is a provisioning story. 
And um, it's got to be cheap to do that, because otherwise the cost, doesn't matter how much the hardware costs, if it costs too much money to install and manage, you know, you lost all the potential value. So we need to find ways of bootstrapping um, and, and, and to deal with the ways that this can unravel. Uh, we need to have better ways of authenticating. So W3C is right now trying to move the web away from username and passwords, which have been an abject failure, and to uh, more stronger ways, um, which can reduce a lot of the, the, the cybercrime around uh, identity theft. And um, we need to ensure that IoT systems are safe to use, uh, you know, even when they go wrong. So safety is not just a thing, not something that's just in a factory of robots and flailing arms. But it, it, all kinds of places where safety, like and obviously in a car, you know, a self-driving car, you want to make sure that, can, that it's completely safe at all times. And then resilience um, is the concept of, uh, as things, things will go wrong, we know they go, go wrong. And it could be that there's sort of hardware faults or software faults or attacks or just things, situations happening you hadn't predicted. So we need to find ways of being able to design systems or systems of systems so that you've got some degree of control in the presence of these uh, faults and attacks. And so there, you know, what are the ways of dealing with that? And that requires sharing sort of best practices. So some of these things like a defense in depth so that if you get through one barrier, the attacker gets through one barrier, there are other barriers to hold them back. There's monitoring so you can see what's going on. Be aware that somebody has crept inside your organization when they shouldn't be. So tripwires, it's trigger alarms and, and, and trigger policies. Machine learning techniques, which can be used to spot behavior which it doesn't, didn't work like that before. What's going on? And get human attention. And then there's sort of policies which describe what to do in certain situations. Like my server is under attack. There's now a service attack by some bunch of hackers somewhere or other. Uh, what do I do? How do I do this? Because you need to be able to do that automatically, uh, whatever time of day it is. Um, privacy is a huge big area. Um, it's, uh, it's featured in this conference positioning. So we need to work on that because for the IoT, there's the, all these different sensors, rich, we have more information about us, tracking us all the time, wherever we are. So we need to address this properly. And we need to address um, weekly identifying information, which we, when you combine sources of information which individually don't identify you, but together do. So there's still a lot of work in this area. And I think there's the, the regulatory approach. There's also the kind of liability approach, which is saying that uh, there's loss of uh, uh, a lot of brand damage when something goes wrong, uh, or liability through of contract law. So there's lots of different work needed in this area. And so again, this is uh, we're still at a fairly early stage for the IoT. And wrapping up, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the kind of hardware and sort of open source projects. This is a, just a very tiny biased sample. It's not, it's just to represent the flavor of what I'm hoping will happen. But essentially, the, the web has been very successful because it was kind of bottom up. At the time, nobody with no big companies thought about the web. I tried to get Hewlett Packard, my employer at the time, to put a lot of resources into the early web. And they thought, no, 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 it's just not important to us at that time. Yes, I know it's going to be important in the future, but right now we have to do all these other things. So the web was lucky because we were able to work on it without those commercial pressures. Um, so big companies, this, they can suppose or stand as top down, but I think there's a great role for small companies and for developers and for maker communities to drive innovation. And for that, we need uh, to build a community around open source, open hardware, uh, and also around these sort of digital, what are called digital accelerators, which allow people to take their ideas and turn them into startups. Um, so I, I've been playing around in my limited spare time with the Arduino and doing some work on that and trying to uh, um, put some libraries and things around the Arduino. The, the Arduino is kind of like a bit out of date now. It's, it's low power. It doesn't really have good network connectivity. It's not really good for security. So these are kind of, we're really looking for a new generation of uh, open hardware which can make it easier to do the IoT, to do the web of things. Um, I came across this, I thought this was quite cool. This is um, a small startup in uh, Beijing, in China. And they've got this idea of kind of Lego blocks. And to make it really, with the Arduino, you have this problem of wiring. You have to sort of patch wires together, you have to solder things together. It's a bit tricky and it's easy to go wrong. And uh, these, these things, they just, they, each board does a very little, only one small thing. But you can plug them together uh, uh, magnetically and then you can connect them up with Lego. 
And so they make it really easy for, for kids even to uh, put together IoT projects. So I think this is an interesting step for the future. Um, yeah. And then we have uh, things like the Raspberry Pi, the more recent versions of the Raspberry Pi, which are powerful enough to run uh, things like Node.js, which is sort of, a, sort of JavaScript interpreters, and to build on the communities around that. And so that with gateways, we can start to do more powerful things around the semantics and security and support multiple protocols. And so I think there's opportunities for developers, the open source communities, to start building these sort of hubs, smart hubs, not relying, leaving it to the big companies, the Intels and the Samsungs and the Apples and the Googles, but actually to do bottom-up stuff from the developer communities themselves. Anyway, I've been playing around this with some uh, uh, colleagues in the UK and uh, hope to do more work in this uh, over the next year or so uh, to put together sort of uh, you know, ideas, libraries around this. So we have a project which is cited here which you're welcome to look at. And I'll kind of wrapping up now and then go into the question and answers. So essentially the idea is the bottom line is the web is going to be essential for realizing the full potential of the IoT. So it's very much in the spirit of W3C's mission to lead the web to the full potential. The web provides a unifying framework for semantic interoperability, ensuring that you can, you're can talking about the same things, you can share the meaning for things, you can discover things, you can compose things. And to enable the web to act as a global marketplace for suppliers and consumers of services. So we have this global you know, scale of services, of suppliers and services. And this is the W3C team, I think, from a few years back in a team day in Shenzhen. So please uh, uh, come and help us build the web. So even if you can't join W3C and work in our groups, we still encourage you to help support like open communities around the, uh, uh, the projects and software and open hardware to make it possible to build a bottom-up um, momentum for deploying open standards in addition to the top-down work that the larger companies can support. So with that, I'd like to, th to thank you. And I'll put my headset on and see if I'm in the right channel for questions. Please, David, sit down, please. Yes, I think. Uh, agora nós teremos... Next, we'll have around five to ten minutes for your questions. So those of you that would like to ask a question, there is a microphone at each one of the sides of the room. Just in the middle of the stage, you'll find the two mics. I will start uh, asking a question to Dave, why do people they get uh, prepared in line? Well, this is a topic which uh, was not approached during, during your presentation, but which I believe is very important, although that's not yet into the layer application, which is the protocol. Much has been said that the HTTP protocol that's not uh, robust enough to meet all the data traffic uh, and information requirements which will go throughout the Internet of Things. On the other hand, it is said that those devices which are connected to the web, they are also devices of the so-called low engineering. There is, it's not possible to fill that up with too many things, such as the HTTP protocol to talk to the internet. How to find a rationale there? How can we have uh, those protocols to the internet of things, to the web of things? Or do you think that the HTTP protocol, and more specifically the HTTP2, will evolve and progress to be able to meet all the requirements of the web of things? That was a kind of fairly long <laughs> question or statement, so I'm afraid I don't remember the details of that one. But um, HTTP itself is obviously a very successful protocol, but it's not the solution for everything. 
So HTTP, it's really good for this sort of client server, this sort of a pull, or, or you could use it in push mode as well, from like pushing from the device, uh, a client into the cloud by making the cloud be the server. But there are lots of needs, there are lots of requirements for other kinds of protocols, like real-time requirements or streaming requirements, where you want to stream from one device to many millions of clients at the same time, where maybe a pub sub model might be more appropriate. So uh, and then we have like web sockets, which provides for asynchronous uh, bidirectional messaging. And uh, so, so essentially, you need to pick the, you need to understand the requirements for your use case for your application and pick the protocol to match. Uh, we have a uma question here, Percival. Percival, do... I am from CGIBR. Internet of Things and connected devices, above all sensors, they are increasing a lot, exponentially increasing, increasing. And it's the first time that in a lecture I listen from a technical standpoint a certain concern regarding ev invasion and the uh, limits in terms of distance or frequency and those are devices which are less potent that will allow to reach a gateway and maybe mitigate uh, possible attacks consequences. Conversely, that such an increase is happening in the business sector. Companies that they go to the market and they might not have such a concern about attacks. What to expect next? Even before we face a, a greater massification of Internet of Things, we have seen uh, cameras, IP devices, a number of devices, citizens' devices carrying critical and sensitive information being used by malwares. So, uh, don't you think that we are already losing such aware from the Internet of Things uh, tax standpoint and maybe the possibilities of uh, using this information to criminal attacks? Okay. Um, if we look back at the early there wasn't much of a concern about security then either or privacy. It's only as it became more widely used and became a, a target for attackers that we started to really focus strongly on security and privacy. And I think the same is true for the IoT, that a lot of people experimenting with IoT, putting products together, they sort of downplayed the importance of security. Uh, but that's changing now. There's a, you know, active work on security. For example, there's even an IoT security foundation. And I, I think there's increasing awareness the need to take security a lot more uh, uh, give them a lot more weight. And I think that, it's, as I said, that each platform, um, each suite of standards around a particular platforms, they uh, tend to approach security within the scope of that platform, but not, so we now need work to really look at the end-to-end -end security across different platforms, particularly the trust models and, and the privacy issues around that. So it's still at an early, early stage, but I, I'm, I'm confident we'll get there. But like everything else, it won't be magic. It won't be some magic button you can press to make I'm now secure. It's going to be more a, a case of a, a predator pay battle, evolutionary uh, in advances by both, by both the attackers and the, the, de the, the um, defenders. Próximo. I am from FATEC, that's a technical university. From a development uh, standpoint, uh, is there any type of language that is more practical to be developed? Or that's not a problem, you just choose and then you go for it. I'm sorry, we have some static here in the booth. I missed uh, the beginning of his question. Would you like me to ask him to repeat, maybe? Or you got it? Okay, thank you. Programming language or scripting languages are, are, are appropriate. So on the web, JavaScript obviously is very important, particularly in the browser and then also on the server with the Node.js community. But there are many other scripting languages. In the early days of the web, there's like a Perl and then and PHP and other uh, Python and Ruby. So in other words, it's going to be different languages 
competing with each other for different niches or different sort of uh, roles. So I, I think this is an area where we can see um, people experimenting to see which languages become more successful, wh which have the strongest co um, communities. And so I think it's really the, the, the size and the, the strength of the communities around the languages which will determine which ones are the winners. Próximo, e nós vamos. So we have a question this side, another one on the opposite side, and another question here, right? Good morning. Thanks for coming. Internet of Things brings some problems in terms of centralization. If your whole house is controlled by Google or by Apple, you will heavily depend on Apple and also there is a risk if Apple is attacked for example and if there's problem in the business model and so on. Google has a lot of control over a large part of society and maybe a company of Internet of Things uh, bankrupts and all of a sudden its device stop working. How is W? 3C concerned in terms of this centralization of Internet of Things being controlled by just a few companies? Okay, so the, the issue there is, you know, are they centralized or decentralized? And it's really a continuum. And I think the standards need to support both, both approaches, that continuum of opportunity. So I think that in the early days, you know, the com companies will naturally build products out which work, you know, a suite of products around their marketplace and try to control that market, that's fairly natural. But as time goes on, they will need to interoperate. And we've seen this before, for example, with digital cameras and digital printers, where initially the, uh, the only printer you could use your camera was by a printer from that same company. And then there's problems that even on the next camera, the same printer wouldn't work. So pretty soon, the strong cost of demand for people to, to have standards to work across these platforms. You want to combine information with different platforms. And a business angle too, that uh, in business you can't rely and have everything from the same vendor for reasons you mentioned. And also, if things have to last over many years, it's always going to be a heterogeneous mix. So we have to be able to support a mix of systems. It can't be purely centralized. And then there's the other extreme, which is fully decentralized. And there's all sorts of interesting work going on in research, but also in startups and sort of small companies looking at how to support more federated approaches and the question is, uh, what is the business model to support that kind of ecosystem? And we're still in early stages, so you, you, your participation in trying to drive that from the research point of view, but also from the, the commercial point of view, is, is, is welcomed. But do you believe that we all will already <coughs> have a decentralized web platform that is reliable? And I'm sorry to kind of joke on that solid uh, platform. The, okay, so in the early days of the web, a web server was one machine, and you could connect to that, and that machine, if it, if it was powered down, had a fault, you wouldn't be able to access the website. But pretty soon people realized if they wanted to have a commercial site, that wouldn't work. So then you have to have server farms and ways of proxying, copying information between servers to make them more reliable. And the same thing applies to the IoT try to find ways to build systems which are reliable and robust. They talked about resilience, and that's very much part of that resilience story. Ciao. Good morning. I'm Tiago Avila from the Federal University of Alagoas, and I also work for the local government. My question has to do with the relationship between the Web of Things and governments. Since W3C works with standards, and we talked a lot about standards for the web of things and Internet of Things, what recommendations would you make to the governments so that they could help us implement, or at least do not get in the way of us implementing the, web, the Internet of Things? So first of all, I have to state this, that W3C itself does not get into policy issues. Because it, what, for W3C to take a position, we have to make sure that all that our members agree. And this would take a long time, and so we've decided not really to go there. Obviously, we have areas where, uh, like accessibility, where we have a lot of active work to try to create an accessible web. And, and, and similarly, for, like on privacy, on privacy, to try to uh, support privacy. But um, I think that really 
governments need to be talking to you know to all these different stakeholders and the you know uh, their citizens in particular to try and figure out what people want and it's got to be a dialogue across because politics is all about people with different mindsets different sort of narratives about what the world is and we've got to be able to reach across those different groups uh, and narratives to try and understand you know what is a practical thing and otherwise we end up with laws which don't really work Okay. And the last question. Could you identify yourself, please? Good morning. I didn't sleep, so I just said good evening anyway. My name is Andre. I have a question which is actually a dilemma. One of the nicest features of the web is the fact is the retro compatibility. So a page that was developed five, ten years ago, is this, it still runs on today's browsers, which adds complexity to the browser engines. Since W3C wants to move towards a quicker type of standardization, and we are dealing with smaller and smaller sized devices that do not have such high processing ability, how are we going to ensure this back compatibility? How can a device made this year will communicate with something that is going to be manufactured in five years' time? How do you plan to maintain the web compatible when we move towards the IoT age? So I think that's a very important topic, which is basically scalability and, and scalability um, over protocols, scalability over time, and scalability over communities. That um, I was the example you used yesterday. Yes, so you start off with one community, and this is, let's say, say Portugal, and they send you know, colon like colonists over to the new world. And initially they're speaking the same language, but over time the language changes. So it's no longer quite the Portuguese in Brazil, it's no longer quite the Portuguese in Portugal. And the same thing will happen to these vocabularies. These uh, standards will evolve somewhat differently in different parts of the world, different communities. It's inevitable. So we need to have uh, architectural frameworks which can support this. So this is why the layering of the, the architectures are really critical. It's not enough to say, I make this work for my community. We've got to have this very clean separation of layers to enable this to work. So the applications, uh, scripts, would continue to work with uh, tomorrow's um, protocols and tomorrow's devices. If you are a script, is too dependent on a particular protocol and that's no longer supported, then what? So this is kind of why we need this layering and why we need this rich metadata to allow one platform to figure out how do I talk to that legacy platform over there? So that's essentially the answer. Okay, muito obrigado, Dave. Thank you very much, Dave, for this opportunity you've given us to share the activities that you've been developing and particularly the initiatives developed by W3C, such as the Internet of Things. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank W3C. And please count on us. Since you're going to stay here until tomorrow, do not be surprised if you are contacted by people in the audience and if they want to ask questions and discuss things in more depth. We are very warm people and we like to talk to people, so do not be surprised. Do not be embarrassed by it, okay? Thank you very much.